Okay, so let me introduce you to Ronald Kerr. Uh, he's from Canada. He started uh, making the first steps in, in astronomy with uh, Denis Francesco it? In, in Canada. But then he moved to, to the University of Texas in, in Austin to work with Stella Ogner and mainly with uh, Alan, 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 Alan Krauss. Krauss, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and today he's going to talk about uh, his, uh, his work, his PhD work, he's not uh, about to get his, his degree, and it's about mapping the transformation of history in the solar medium. So I, I hope uh, everybody finds it interesting. Great, great, thank you, Javier, and, and thank you very much for the invitation to come here. I'm very excited to uh, be able to explore your institute and uh, experience your beautiful country. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll start talking about uh, the work that I've been doing uh, for the last uh, four or five years, years or so, and that is about using dense solar populations to learn about star formation. And oops, I thought that was a good slide. Uh, there we go. Okay, cool. So uh, I'll start out with this general picture of uh, star formation. We start with a uh, some sort of cloud of gas, not necessarily a, a spherical one, often a filamentary one, and it will collapse into the weight of gravity fragment. Those fragments will uh, become uh, dense enough to be able to form stars. Those stars will eventually begin to blast away the starting gas material, leaving behind just a solar population with the gas fully dispersed. However, as you might know, uh, you know, a lot of the very fascinating physics happens in the gas phase, but as soon as that gas is dispersed, the, uh, the, the evidence of the processes that were happening in the gas are lost from the gas, and it's only the stars that are left behind that essentially act as test particles to record elements of the properties of the gas that formed them. And this includes the, uh, the velocities that, that have been uh, given to the stars by the gas, the, uh, the times of formation of, of those stars given by their ages, and by combining all this information about the properties of the stars, we can uh, create this very long star formation uh, record that traces the history of a star population over tens of millions of years that is visible for tens of millions of years after formation is finished. So there are a few things we can do with this sort of a record. So we can identify when star formation begins and ends, if there's a very brief event, that, uh, that's rare, and if we, uh, we are much more likely to be able to detect it in terms of the record than in terms of something that's currently happening. And we can also, and this is what, what I'm most focused on, is investigating the evolution of slow processes, ones that happen over tens of millions of years, and uh, large-scale circulation processes that go up to the scale of spiraling arms and galaxies. And uh, just to give you a sense of the sort of processes that I'm looking at here, we have the concept of triggered star formation. And there should be a video here, but oh, there we go. Okay, it's coming. So basically, the, the concept behind triggered star formation was that, okay, huh. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> All right, well, the concept of triggered star formation is essentially you have a, uh, a supernova or a, uh, or, 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 you know, a uh, feedback from, from uh, young stars that compresses adjacent gas material and causes stars to form. So I will have to get back to the, okay, is that good? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, so essentially what happens is that by uh, using solar feedback combined with uh, you know, supernovae, we can compress gas material and cause star formation, uh, both uh, causing star formation to propagate across individual star form regions and also causing star formation to occur on much larger scales. And on the cloud scale, we get this concept here, which is called sequential star formation. And this is where you have uh, radiation from stars in one part of the cloud that compresses gas in, in an adjacent part of the cloud that then produces more stars that compresses gas in an adjacent part of the cloud and so on and so on. And you essentially use up the entirety of the gas in the uh, cloud over the span of uh, you know, 10 million years or so. And when you look at larger and larger scales, you get a wide variety of different processes happening. So, you know, on large scales, you have these like, big spiral density waves that, that lead from the galaxy and sort of drive over densities on those larger scales. And then at smaller scales, you see these bubbles here, 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 all these little dark areas where there's less gas. And that's uh, usually because there has been a uh, cluster has formed, you know, a supernova has gone off. You've had basically processes that have cleared that gas. And that combination of compression of gas by these bubbles and the overdensities driven by these fire alarms combine to influence the star formation throughout the galaxy. 
And we can learn about the structural evolution of that galaxy by combining the dynamics of stars with surveys of young populations over the entirety of the solar neighborhood. And there have been some simulations that have been uh, investigating exactly this sort of concept. So, so uh, you know, it starts from the gas over densities. And here we have a simulation of uh, gas from the, uh, the fire simulations. This is from uh, Viviano Segura's work. And you can see that, uh, you know, you have this evolution of gas over time. And you can see the evolution of the, uh, you know, spark alarm patterns and bubbles. So here's a big bubble going off here. And you'll notice that as this big bubble goes off, it sweeps away gas and produces a dense filament. And that dense filament happens to be very similar to a structure that we see uh, in the solar neighborhood. So by uh, using stars as essentially dust particles to trace the uh, densest regions of the evolution of the gas, we can learn, learn a lot about how the stars that are within that have formed. And of course, we can inform the models by uh, using the results of those uh, studies. And there have been quite a few studies recently that have uh, taken advantage of the uh, incredible resources from the Gaia uh, survey to uh, look for young stars and young sort of populations to address these sort of questions. So this includes basically two major categories that were active at the time that I started the work. So first, we have the uh, the, the, the like uh, age independent clustering work from groups like Kunt and Kobe from the team. Uh, Senegal, these are these all sky surveys to look for open clusters and associations, but they're not uh, limited by age. And as a result, they are less sensitive to detecting the most uh, you know, uh, fine and, and, and uh, um, minor uh, young associations. And we also have some work from groups like Ken Talk about that and all, who did work on uh, the uh, Velvet complex here, and uh, uh, Zari et al., uh, did, who did the Orion complex. And these are targeted surveys that focus on the young stars, but don't look at the broader picture of what's happening for the entire solar neighborhood. And at the time that I started this work, that was the, the, the really the, the missing thing that I wanted to, to fill in was the need for broad searches to look for young star populations, get this incredibly deep view of the populations that exist, and use those to learn about how star formation is assembling both on local scales and on larger galactic scales. So that is the objective. I realize I pretty already said all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, perform a deep and spatially biased search for young stars and uh, estimate ages. Identify several star uh, with histories indicative of unfamiliar star formation mechanisms that are worthy of follow-up. This is like the, those uh, triggering mechanisms and the sequential star formation, and then bridge the gap between local star formation and galactic scales. And the method that we use is essentially uh, this. So it's a Bayesian approach where we've got the kind of data, which is excellent. It has these beautiful properties for uh, you know, positions, velocities, uh, and uh, importantly for this, photometry. And what we can do is we can, we can compare that to a model. So this model uh, takes uh, known values or known distributions of ages, masses, metallicities, and multiplicities. We can combine all those factors and through uh, using an isochronal model, so it's the uh, RSIC version 1.2S isochrones, excuse me, uh, we can essentially uh, uh, compute expected values of the photometry. So that is the magnitudes and the, uh, the colors for each star in the sample. We can then add reddening uh, in the direction of whatever star interests us. And then, you know, the model stars have known values for all key properties. The Gaia stars have absolute magnitudes, but don't have ages or masses or anything like that. So we can say what percentage of model stars near a given Gaia star have an age that is less than 15 million years, or, or uh, you know, um, that have an age that is less than 15, 15 million years. And that sets the probability that a star is young in our model. So uh, what I do is I, uh, you know, identify, you know, stars according to that metric. And that reveals two major regions where stars are identified as young. First of all, there are the, uh, the, the very tip of the main sequence, which is our own B stars. And we know that those are young because if they were not young, they'd be dead because they don't live very long. And then further down on the uh, pre-main sequence, we have stars that are above the main sequence. And they are above the main sequence because they are uh, uh, very young. And in the uh, young, uh, you know, uh, early on in the stellar evolution, the stars are quite bloated because they haven't fully contracted to their final position on the main sequence. So they're bigger, and as a result, they are brighter. So that's why you can identify those so this is essentially everything redward of uh, both G8, all the way down to the bottom of the mm -hmm. yes? Uh, 
how do you how can you distinguish between other factors such like metallicity, for example? Yeah, so so basically, uh, so metallicity is included in this, and uh, you know, uh, different metallicities will produce different uh, uh, photometry here. And that is taken into account when we do our probabilities of, of youth. So we basically have a floor for probability of youth where we say, if it's above this value, we count as being young. And that essentially removes all, uh, you know, it, it, it only identifies stars as young, where there are basically no other ways that a star could be there other than it being young. So this removes the chance of binary contamination, which is still present, but it's low, and metallicity contamination, which again, is still present, but low. Okay, so each point is, uh, for each point, you have a probability of certain properties. Yes, okay. exactly. That's right. Did you say that binary contamination is low? Uh, well, binary contamination is the main source of contamination. Um, although um, it, it, it is uh, taken down as much as possible through this method. I, I think. I think uh, in the last paper it was about uh, the. Uh, 40%, 30, 40% contamination rate. It, it, it's in the most recent paper that, uh, that I uh, wrote. Anyway, so using this method, I made an acronym that re refers to the type of stars that I identify. Stars with one of young young luminosities around the solar system. And it is with these stars that we can start to identify uh, young populations and use those to learn about formation processes. And the first thing that we do is we, we need to cluster these stars. So essentially we apply uh, clustering in space and velocity coordinates. And I use this HTB scan clustering algorithm. And the major advantage of this is that it doesn't just look at stars at, or, or uh, at clusters along one scale. So what's typical in clustering algorithms is, you know, you've got some distribution and you say, okay, things above this level, that's a clump. And the result of that is that you often get uh, clusters that follow exactly what the person that, that set the clustering algorithm wanted to get. Mm -hmm. So uh, the advantage of the HGB scan is that it essentially scans at various different clustering levels. And it says, okay, what clusters last the longest throughout a different range of scales? Uh, and as a result, we're going to get these uh, clusters that are uh, you know, the most persistent, is what we call them. And this can both uh, reveal you know, these very large clusters that are substantial on, on, on large scales, but because we're looking at, at the clustering over many different scales, we're just as sensitive to very small clusters as we are to very large clusters. So we have no, sensi no sensitivity to input parameters and we're able to detect these smallest populations within the sample. Then we can do our clustering on our sample of young stars. And we can get this beautiful map mapping the uh, distribution of the associations within uh, 333 parsecs here. This is from my first paper published in 2021. And uh, you can see this you know, beautiful network of the associations around the sun. And I recently expanded this work to a kiloparsec. And here you see uh, 116 groups, um, 10 of which are completely new and 20 have no direct equivalent literature. So we really are pushing the boundaries of the known populations up to and beyond the limits of what has been shown in previous surveys. Sorry, mm -hmm. you already mentioned what kind of accuracy do you get from this kind of cluster? I'm putting in my accuracy. In so uh, have you checked it versus uh, known cluster membership? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we have a lot of, uh, we're, we're detecting the, the vast majority of clusters that are uh, of this uh, uh, age uh, range. I, I don't think there are many uh, clusters in, in this mass or in this age range, like less than 30 million years, that do not come up in the survey. So uh, we're, we, we have a very, very high rate in terms of detections. And then we have a large number of new detections as well. Um, and you might say, that's not 116. Well, there's the rest of them. I couldn't fit them all in the same plot with, uh, and, and have it be uh, legible. Uh, and there are quite a few features that we can uh, point out in these maps. So first of all, we have the emergence of some notable uh, large structures. So uh, the one that is most interesting to me is this population here, uh, Sacher. And I will uh, discuss this one later on in the talk, because it's, uh, it's really quite a fascinating, fascinating region in that it has a, a scale comparable to many uh, well-known populations like uh, uh, Scope Sen in terms of you know, the number of stars, which is more than 10,000, the scale, which is more than 300 parsecs. However, this population has really only been known in the last uh, three years or so. So very new grounds to do a lot of new research on, uh, 
uh, on structural processes in an environment that's quite comparable to ones that we already know of. And uh, we also have some interesting connections emerging between populations living previously well, for example, Perseus and Orion. And these are two populations that are fairly far apart on the sky. However, it turns out that there's actually a low density bridge that directly connects the two populations. And this is not to say that uh, Orion and Perseus formed out of the same cloud. I don't think that's the case. But what I could say is that, you know, you may have had some sort of like driving process or a bubble or something like that that could have, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically driven uh, star formation in both. And you could have had a bit of a strand connecting them that could have formed stars uh, in between, yes. What is the range of ages in, in the stars? They're actually pretty consistent across all of them. So the, the uh, sort of... Uh, um, older populations in Orion and Perseus are both at around uh, 50 to 20 million years. And then in uh, the intermediate populations, it's actually quite similar. So the ages are, are actually quite remarkably similar across the whole uh, range, yes. So each point is a star, right? Yes. But not, not just young stars. It's, uh, oh, oh, okay, no, sorry. Oh, no, yes, is it just young stars? This is just the young stars. We, we bring the older stars back in later. So we basically say, okay, this is a seed population. This is where we know that there are young stars. What we do is we look around those young stars and we identify, um, you know, uh, stars that have uh, properties that match in terms of position and velocity. Yeah, and, 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 and that, that essentially identifies the populations that are not detectable using metric methods. Okay, so basically you, you, you look for the, the most massive stars mm -hmm. and then you check the surrounding. I mean, it's more like the least massive stars because those are the ones that are uh, most detectable. The, those are the ones that are on the sequence. And uh, okay. as a result, we can identify them based on that elevated position of the sequence. So yeah, it's sort of weird. The, the stars that we can detect well are, are very dim. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of the opposite problem that we often have, yes? Uh, is this centered on the sun? This uh, yes, yes, exactly. It's, uh, why, why is Orion so close? Oh, it's because there, are, there happen to be low density streamers that come off in many different directions. Yeah, uh, the, the, yeah we, we can discuss this later on. It's, uh, there's a lot of interesting low density structure around Orion that, that we've really not touched on whatsoever. And I have some like observational data on it, but uh, mm -hmm. I have not had the time to get to it. So where would be the main like Orion nebula cluster? That would that should be about minus. But it should be about the four hundred four hundred ten yeah, yeah, that's about right. So this is the uh, distance center of the sun. Yeah, right about there. Okay. Yeah. But this is in the plane of the of the galaxy. Yeah, looking top there. Yeah. yeah. It's not far off. It's just right. It's minus. <laughs> All right, so uh, moving on here, um, there are also quite a few interesting features at smaller scales. So there are some clusters that have uh, a combination of high velocities and positions above or below the galactic plane that are very high as well. So velocities can be upwards of 20 kilometers or 40 kilometers per second transverse and positions more than four, uh, 200 parsecs above or below the galactic plane. And this is unusual because, you know, most star formation is, you know, it has velocity similar to most of the gas in the Milky Way. So that is similar to the sun. And it has uh, positions that are close to the galactic plane, which is where all the gas is. So this opens up the possibility of a very unique uh, star forming environment occurring here. And this could be through the uh, infall of cold gas parcels from higher up in the plane, falling in towards the galactic plane, interacting with gas that's present there, and essentially forming stars and being shot up the other side, maintaining some of the velocity that it had on infall. So, but just in general, through all of this uh, work here, we're realizing many different environments where we can decode star of histories. And that's what I intend to do, or what I am currently doing with association level key studies. And the concept behind these is essentially this. So we want, we want to reconstruct star of histories for associations. We start with, uh, you know, a selection of known members. We uh, then uh, know where they are. We know their, uh, their motions, and we can trace these back in time to their locations at formation. Uh, and those locations are indicated by their ages. And we can essentially show how one starfish event can relate to other events and can lead to other events. And this can, can be done for a combination of uh, Gaia, which can uh, help with membership, 
can give locations of stars, we can give uh, excellent crop motions. And then through new spectroscopy, we can refine uh, star membership, we can uh, 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 improve the radial velocities, the sky, uh, the radial component of the velocity vector, and we can get uh, improved methods for computing those ages. And uh, you know, UT is excellent when it comes to the uh, to this follow up. You know, we've got the uh, public access to Gaia. Then we have the access to uh, uh, telescopes like two point seven meter at uh, the Nippon Observatory, and this is great for for collecting large amounts of uh, high resolution spectra for these associations uh, quickly. And once we have this like complete data set that combines the uh, Gaia measurements and spectroscopy. We can uh, use, uh, you know, we can do this uh, regional study blueprint here. So step one, you, you know, use a large survey to choose a population you think is going to be interesting for follow-up observations. We use new observations for set membership. We cluster to identify subgroups. We then compute ages, which combine a number of methods, uh, and we can then trace the stars uh, and subgroups back to their origins, revealing the pattern of the star formation in that group. So step one. I like this one. It's nice and close by, fairly substantial, almost no study up until uh, when I started looking at it. So let's uh, go through these steps for this population. This is for CPS for no, CFN from here on forward. Um, so first things first, identify members. And this uses two different methods. So I mentioned before that you know the initial membership selection identifies stars here which are the ones that are identifiable as young by the photometry. So what we do is we search for stars with uh, uh, velocities and positions, and this reveals you know, all of these stars have consistent positions and velocities. Then stars that are here cleanly separate between the premium sequence and main sequence. However, once the premium sequence merges onto the main sequence, which is uh, from about this point onwards, you can see that those two sequences are not separable. And as a result, we need to use a combination of RVs, which give this additional loss of dimension that give us a much stronger sense of whether the stars are co-moving. And then we can also use lithium depletion, which is a great indicator for whether or not the star is in fact young. So once we have our, uh, our population of confident uh, members, we can then apply HDV scan. And this time we'll find no fragmentation. So this time we're not uh, clustering for the most persistent groups, we're clustering for the smallest scale groups. And the reason we do this is because we're trying to detect the, the, uh, the populations that are the most fundamental units. And the most fundamental units in the cluster are most likely to have very similar ages and very similar locations where they form. So we're breaking up as much as possible and we're going to compute uh, ages for each individual clump uh, in this population. But you can see we have a lot of nice uh, Stop starting emerging in uh, CFN here. And then we compute ages, and there are four methods that we use to uh, combine to compute ages. So, first of all, we have isochrones. And isochrones are great for determining whether star A is older or younger than star B. However, the models, uh, isochrone models, often disagree by a lot. And by a lot, I mean like a factor of two or more. So, as a result, if you really want to get good, like, uh, um, absolute ages, you need to use other methods to better constrain the scale of the isochrome models. And through that, we can do dynamical ages, which essentially, you know, you take a bunch of stars, yeah? Ages um, uh, So for every one of the dynamical ages, it's when the star forms. For dynamical ages, it's when the gas disperses enough to let them disperse. So, you know, the concept behind dynamical ages is that you take the stars in the present day, you trace them back in time, at some point in the past there's a most compact configuration, and we're saying that that is when these, the gas disperses. Not when the stars form, when the gas disperses. There's a bit of an offset there. Um, and that offset can be calibrated through, you know, uh, you know fitting with the isochrones and, uh, you know, calibrating with the lithium depletion, and the after seismic ages, which are two other methods that are great for pinning down the absolute ages of these, these associations. And when we uh, combine all these methods, we actually find that there's an offset between the combined isochronal ages and the dynamical ages of about 3 million years, which is quite consistent with the uh, time scales of gas dispersal that we expect in populations like this. 
So we've done all the steps leading up to this. So now we can trace all the stars uh, and suburbs back to their origins and try to reconstruct how this population formed. So one question, Roman. So uh, could you say that in principle, the difference between the isochronic age and, uh, and well, I can't remember how Dynamic. to call it, them. Yeah. So it's basically like a measure of the time scale it takes for the clump to be dispersed by the first stars that are in If the isochronal so, ages are properly calibrated, then yes, the gap between them will be the time scale of, of dispersal of the gas. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so basically what you're going to be seeing here, and I'll be showing a few of these uh, going down the road, but uh, I am taking the positions of real stars with real velocities. These are not simulations. I trace them back in time, and then I am letting them come back in and, you know, when they pop in, there is the first group forming, and then we have more formation, more formation, and you can sort of see what we're seeing here. So this is a video of the entire history of the formation of this complex. And the first thing that you notice is that we have two formation nodes emerging out of this pattern. So, you know, so, so you see that, uh, you know, after starfish begins, we end up uh, uh, having two distinct regions where starfish progresses. And in both regions, star formation lasts about 10-ish uh, about, uh, million years. And it just so happens that, the, uh, that this sort of node structure, this division of a population into two separate nodes, is actually not easily detectable without using traceback. Um, and uh, just a quick aside as to the possible uh, implications of this sort of like uh, double node structure. Yeah? But that only traces back the, the velocity vector and the age. Yes. So there are no interactions between them. Yeah, so these are, are uh, low enough density regions that we can normally uh, ignore the effects of gravitational. Um, in denser regions like uh, like the of the ONC, that is not an option. So this is a limited, uh, so, so we need to uh, you know uh, include potentials if we're going to be doing something like that. But for a low density region like this, it's pretty well. And so when, when the dot appears there, it's yes. because that's the time corresponding to that's its isochronal age, for example. Uh, it's combined age. Uh, it's age combining all four methods okay. that we use. So, so we, we've used the uh, dynamical age plus an offset and matched that with the uh, with the uh, isochronal ages and gotten a synthesis age essentially. And uh, in this population, um, we actually see that. Uh, so, so the difference, the the uh, distance between the two uh, nodes. Is about 30 million years, which is fairly consistent with the scales of some known uh, filamentary structures. So what we could be seeing here is essentially a filament which is collapsing and has had uh, two separate uh, collection points where gas is flowing in and continuously re re uh, replenishing the uh, clump over a time scale of about 10 million years. And an important note here is that the current clusters may not reflect the structure of formation. So uh, in SpyGloss 1, I did, did like an initial clustering of this region, and it only separated the population into two subgroups, one containing most of the population, and the darker one at the top, which contains uh, just uh, beta CPI. And beta CPI is this group right here, which is actually quite central in the uh, uh, larger of the two clumps. So what, what you realize is that the positions in, in uh, you know, position of velocity space in the present day are not often reflective of the, uh, you know, the structure of the, uh, of the region at, uh, at creation. And as a result, often traceback is necessary to reveal these structures. And here's another region that I've been uh, doing some work on. So this is uh, Forex for Lokium and the Oscar Complex. This is a group that combines a number of nearby associations. These are all quite nearby, within about 120 parsecs. And uh, we can rerun the same methodology as for CFM and see what sort of structure we get out of this. And once again, you can see the emergence of what, what's going to be two nodes here. So there's a top four uh, already formed. And then we're going to have uh, Forex for Lodium and Chimel for Nexus right about now. There we go. And then Karina and Columba are going to form right as they converge in the location of Forex for Lodium right there. So once again, we see this like, two node structure consistent with what we saw in uh, CFM. And one thing to note here is that this population right, right here, I want you to uh, keep an eye on that one, that is Plate 8, 
And that is actually a cluster typically associated with uh, scope sand. So each point is an individual star over here, or is it a subcluster? Yeah, yeah. So, so each point is an individual star. Uh, this little marker here, that's just the, the core of what they ate, that cluster, which is, uh, you know, whenever we're tracing back clusters, we can't really trace by individual stars and clusters because uh, clusters have internal motions. And if you trace those back, they go off infinity. So we need to sort of like average those out to get a meaningful result when we're doing clusters. But the rest are uh, unbound. So trace back is meaningful for those. So, Ron, so mm -hmm. here uh, it gives me the impression that the different groups are affecting each other. Is that true? Uh, yes, yeah, it's a pair of case. There does appear to be a bit of a uh, velocity vector between the two. But that was in a who's all way. In this case? Uh, no, no, not necessarily. In, in CFN, it seems to be uh, fairly, uh, there doesn't appear to be like a clear attraction between the two. In, uh, in this population, there does appear to be a bit of a, you know, velocity factor that, that How is How often would you say that this approach, this approach between different groups? Well, as of right now, we have two examples where I've done this. So uh, sample size of two, we have one yes, one no. So 50% uh, <laughs> so far, we need to do more of these. <laughs> Now, the uh, other last question, um, yeah. you have these uh, uh, brown uh, squares, okay. and at the beginning they are quite far apart. So, mm. did, did they, how, how do HDBs can manage to say that these are part of the same group? Uh, yeah, so, so earlier on, on, on the simulation, there are going to be some uh, stars that just have weird velocities, mm -hmm. and that could just be because of like an unknown companion, or just, I don't know, a bad RV measurement. There could be a lot of reasons why stars in trace back end up way over here. So they could just not be members. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why that could happen. But uh, anyway, what I wanted to mention about this was that, so K8 is this, this little, little uh, cluster here. And it actually stays nearby to the rest of the population for almost its entire time forming. And it actually has very smart ages to it as well. However, typically it's not associated with the author complex, it's associated with uh, SCOSIN. And SCOSIN is this massive uh, other nearby association. And as a result, you know, if this is here, well, these two populations are forming, why are we saying that uh, these two are together and this one isn't? And if that one's connected to SCOSIN, then why isn't the whole thing also connected to SCOSIN? So we get to this problem where we get to like larger and larger scales, things start connecting, and it becomes more and more difficult to say, you know, what one's where one star formation then begins and the next or one star formation then ends and the, and the uh, next begins by large scales do you mean about what size scales uh 100 plus parsecs uh basically going towards the scales of uh, spiral numbers so if you had things like supernova explosions or in the previous 40 million years or maybe maybe even effects from tidal forces if could that affect the and here here there is an assumption of Backwards ballistic motion, no? mm -hmm. so could that affect? Uh, certainly possible, yes. Um, so uh, the the results of uh, of these analyses have been a lot more difficult to get uh, consistent when we're dealing with uh, you know uh, clusters that have uh, that are in very dense regions. So this is like you know central sections of uh, Sefer, for example, um, can have uh, more complicated trace paths. But uh, when it comes to and probably simple regions like this, where there isn't a lot of gas present, it tends to work pretty well. Anyway, um, so just a quick recap of this part of the talk. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, what, what are some errors on this? What's the plus or minus thing that they get from this? Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so I, I think the, there are much bigger systematic errors than there are like internal errors. So, the, uh, uh, so you know, as I mentioned to, to Javier, I, these stars that are very outlying, these are populations that are, or stars that have, uh, that, that may have like binary companions, and those binary companions are, you know, introducing this uh, error in motion that, that is not uh, readily detectable. But uh, um, just to give you a, a rough, like, um, uncertainty here, so we're really only including stars, or we try to only include stars that have uncertainties uh, lower than one kilometer per second, and uh, that propagates to, you know, uh, 30 parsecs over 30 million years. So it's roughly that sort of scan. Um, anyway, so big, big uh, takeaways from this regional trace back. So we find that we have these nodes emerging, and these are these, uh, you know, these are like clumps where we have multiple generations of co-spatial star formation. And these might be one of the more, uh, you know, coherent uh, 
uh, representations of you know, a star forming event. And we also have the fact that star formation is interconnected. And then as we look at larger and larger scales, we see that uh, you know, the current configurations can be misleading and association, and association boundaries can blur on our scales. And therefore our regional context is often important. And that brings me to the research that I'm currently working on. And I'll probably go through this fairly quickly because we don't have a ton of time left. But uh, we have populations like SCOSAN, and I have about 1,300 spectra from the Anglo Australian Telescope on this one. And uh, this is a great laboratory for star formation, containing more than 10,000 stars, and also includes patterns consistent with sequential star formation. So here is a map that I made in my first paper uh, in SPECLUS 1. And you can see here, so this is age on the uh, on color bar. So uh, the yellow colors are the uh, ages around 20 million years. The uh, dark purple is around, uh, uh, you know, going down as low as uh, 2.5. Um, but you can see here that we have an old population that sort of covers the spine here, like that. Uh, we're referring to this as, as the uh, Libra Centaurus Park, which is this oldest population in Skosan, about 20 million years old. And then going away from it, we get progressively younger ages. So here we get ages from 10 to 9. Uh, here we get ages from 20 down to also 9. And here are ages 20 down to 12. So this could be an indication of this slow progression star formation moving out from the uh, Libra Centaurus arc towards these more outlying regions and using up the gas as it goes. And we actually see very similar patterns in a lot of other associations. So on the left, we have uh, Sky 89, a uh, very newly discovered population, really no work done it so far. And you can see once again, all down to And here in uh, uh, Lago Orleans, we have a very dense cluster with very uh, massive stars in the center. And you can see around the edges, young stars. And those young stars have to coincide with, uh, with very, uh, dense clouds that are so active there and are so actively forming stars. So this is actually the, uh, the edge of a bubble driven by the cluster at the center. And that appears to be uh, triggering and supporting uh, populations around the edges. And just another quick one. Here's uh, uh, Lambda for uh, Lister OB1. And you can see once again, we have a sequence from Holtian going from south to north. So lots of very fascinating groups that we're seeing in, in uh, these studies, and most of these have seen very little work uh, in looking at it from this perspective. So it's something that I'm interested in uh, exploring more in the future. So we have this really overload of fascinating young, young associations with this diversity and complexity uh, of different circulation patterns and different structures. And by starting to combine many of these individual uh, you know, studies, we can sort of bridge the gap to larger scales. And the poster child for doing exactly that is my work on the uh, Sandra Association, which is this very substantial population that has been really newly discovered and uh, spans uh, 300 parsecs end to end -end and has an age range of about 30 to 60 million years. And, uh, excuse me. Uh, Work done so far already reveals some new structure. So even though in uh, uh, transverse velocity space, it looks like a very continuous population, it turns out there's actually a split in RV, which is indetectable in that uh, five-dimensional phase space. So this is basically to say that uh, often that sixth dimension is very important if you want to really uh, get a, a very detailed view of the structure. Um, and uh, moving on from that, we also have a very diverse environment emerging in both these sort of RV subclubs of uh, Sector. So you can see that this is a uh, figure that shows uh, the, the uh, virial state of the populations. Red is a bound cluster. Uh, blue is a, uh, an unbound association. And orange is ambiguous. I need to get to looking at those more closely. Uh, and you can see that we have a very wide range of populations, ranging from very dense clusters all the way to very sparse associations. And this is in contrast to something like Upper Sco, where we really don't see this sort of dense cluster yet. So it gives us an opportunity to say, okay, is this the sort of thing that emerges through the evolution of clusters that already exist? Or is this something that is indicative of different processes that led to the formation of Sefer versus Gosen? 
What's the spatial size scale on, on that previous block? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to do that. Yeah, so this is about 300 parsecs again. Um, mm -hmm. So 300 parsecs by about 100. And then uh, mm -hmm. the northern fragment, which is this one, this is the one that is, uh, has the higher RVs, uh, similar dynamics to substantial open clusters. And then a series of uh, younger or, or uh, smaller associations around that. And uh, once again, scales about 150 parsecs by 100 parsecs. And then, probably the most interesting thing about uh, Sefer, or at least one of the more interesting things about Sefer, is it actually has a, 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 an orientation that is perpendicular to what's called the Radcliffe wave. And the Radcliffe wave is this very large um, sort of wall of gas right here, which aligns with the structure of the uh, local spiral arm. So the spiral arm, arm pitch is essentially this and this. You just from like imagine these as being like arms of the, of the, uh, the spiral galaxy. But uh, Sefer and this uh, southern population here actually have an orientation directly perpendicular to that. So, you know, could this be an example of star formation line not with uh, the spiral arm, but with spur structure? So we can see this. Uh, image of the galaxy here, or of uh, M74 here, where we have spiral arm, spiral arm, and there's a network of gas in between the two. So you can sort of imagine placing this diagram over top, where we have the right of the wave and split and spiral arms, and then uh, Sefer and the southern uh, uh, grouping uh, connected to uh, spurs. However, uh, from my talk so far, you probably got the idea that the positions of stars in the present day often don't reflect where they were when they formed. So what we need to do is trace back, and I have really pre preliminary results uh, to, that, to that effect. And uh, here it is. So I've walked the galactic center to the right, uh, so the spiral arm pitch is about like this, and you'll see that the initial star formation actually does follow the spiral arm pitch. However, as, as this initial generation reaches the uh, center of the screen here, we see a massive burst of star formation. And that burst of star formation may have been uh, triggered by the convergence with this initial generation. Uh, there's also this little clump coming up from the side. That's that uh, sort of uh, northern fragment that, that I mentioned as having a different RV. So we have a lot of like new uh, clumps, new, uh, new nodes emerging through this result. But, uh, we need to do a lot more work on this because uh, you can see the scales that this is happening over. And these are not association scales, these are galactic scales. And if you really want to understand how this thing came to be, there's going to be associations that are missing that we need to know more about if we want to really uh, piece together the whole story about how this association came to be. This still doesn't take into account the galactic potential, but I think. Oh, it, it's going through the uh, yeah. So all, all the traceback is using uh, Galpi. It's uh, is using the uh, galactic potential and tracing back through the, the galactic potential. The only thing that's not included is local so from clouds and from clusters. Anyway, so what I'm going to do in the, in the near future is essentially this. So uh, you know, galactic star formation mapping. So you know. We uh, combine the populations over, you know, kiloparts of volume. Uh, we get their ages, we get their uh, positions and velocities, and we can uh, trace these back in time and show exactly where, you know, each single star formation event in the solar neighborhood was when it formed, and use that to reconstruct patterns of star formation on spiral arm scales and compare those to things like the models I showed earlier, which show the evolution of the galaxy under the uh, influence of uh, uh, spiral arms and of uh, expanding models. So that is the end of my uh, stars part of the talk. Although I think that I don't have time for planets. This is a long part of the talk. Although I realize I'm at uh, um, 12.50 here. So should I stop or should I run through this quickly? Five minutes? Sure, why not? All right, sure. <laughs> planets. So people like to use my list for planets because uh, a lot of very fascinating physics happens in, in the first 100 million years after formation. And, uh, you know, these sort of processes include, uh, you know, the loss of the envelopes of, of planets, the, uh, uh, you know, the time scales of hot Jupiter assembling in, into their orbits, and the processes that, that, uh, that guide that. Uh, how uh, wide orbiting massive planets form? Is it through uh, you know, direct collapse or, or gradual accretion? These are all questions that can be answered by getting a very strong sample of young planets 
that can trace the evolution of, of uh, country systems in this first 100 million years. So we need to get uh, ages and we need to get association memberships. And those, and those association memberships are critical for getting those ages. So I really published some work on this. So um, I'm working with uh, a uh, postdoc at Caltech, uh, Luke Bauma, and basically what he does is he uh, you know, cross-matches my uh, lists with, uh, the, uh, with the Kepler sample, and he actually found that there were four planets in the Kepler field in my Sephir association. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And it just so happens that uh, three of these are the smallest planets ever discovered with ages of less than 40 million years. And these are probing the regime for the first time uh, before the loss of atmospheres uh, has occurred in the uh, radius gap, uh, which is the, uh, the area of, uh, of the sort of like uh, a size distribution of planets where the radiation from the star is thought to have blown away the uh, outer envelope of low mass planets, leaving behind a relatively small atmosphere. And uh, more work is ongoing. So there have been a couple of planets in my, in my spyglass list discovered through uh, TESS, and we're expecting more of those soon. And coming up in the future, we have the uh, Plato mission. And Plato is going to be basically staring at big chunks of the sky for uh, uh, upwards of a year, uh, especially in the uh, long duration observing phase. And it just so happens that uh, these are, oops, hold on. It just so happens that these fields are perfect for finding planets around uh, stars in, in young associations. So you can see here that the northern field contains almost all the sever, along with a big chunk of CCLB23 and a big chunk of uh, CFM. And then in the uh, south, we have almost the entire Velo complex, which is upwards of 20,000 stars, massive sample for us to investigate to discover uh, new populations there. And there are also a few clumps in the southern field that have uh, only been found in the lists. And as a result, the only way to get proper ages for them is to really, you know, consistently improve the age results and the uh, you know, studies of these young populations that have been discovered through spyglass. So with that, oh, hold on, wrong direction. <laughs> there we go. With that, I'll leave up my conclusion slide and then we have to take any questions. Thank you. So let's see some hands for questions here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So I have three very big questions. The first is you have masses for all these stars you have. Oh, rough, yes. yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. So the, the second question is then uh, you could use these masses to study like the IMF as a function of uh, your clusters? Yes. I, can this be done? Uh, yeah, I have like, very rough uh, versions of this uh, in the past. So uh, in uh, my study of CFN, I did like a, a brief uh, of the, the, uh, the masses, is this consistent with the uh, typical IMF? The result there was essentially, yeah, pretty much. Um, now, there are regions where I actually think that there might be a different IMF. So, um, so in some of these like, very small populations with very weird velocities, um, we're noticing that even though we are finding in the start, we're finding very strong uh, lines, we're seeing like much fewer massive stars than we probably should. So, you know, we're getting like an expected hit rate of about uh, um, one in three, and we're getting a hit rate of one in 10. So we might be seeing a weird IMF in this case. Okay, and the question is, uh, so uh, what is the star formation rate of the local volume? Uh, that is something we are working on. That, that, it was part of my postdoc application, I said I was going to do that, but I, I have not done that yet. <laughs> but you. it certainly can be done using these uh, studies. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So one of the motivations of your talk at the beginning was mm -hmm. looking for sequential star formation. Yes. Although you didn't mention much about it. Uh, but so uh, what are your findings uh, about this? Uh, in particular, are there like any typical time scales for the time for the sequential events of star formation that you find, or is this very random? Yeah, sure thing. So uh, we actually have like fairly uh, consistent, you know, roughly 10 million year time scales in a lot of these regions. So that's the, the case in, uh, in uh, the eastern half of, uh, of uh, uh, Skosan. 
as well as uh, Vela, where we have a sequence going away from uh, the Lando or the uh, Gamma uh, Valorum cluster from from about uh, 13 million at the uh, at the core to about 5 million at the outer edges. So it seems that we have a fairly consistent time scale of about 10 million years for all of these. And in uh, SWOSEN, we actually computed a, uh, a, a velocity of propagation. And it came out to about uh, four kilometers per second or four parsecs per, per million years. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because I was going to touch on, on the velocity. Mm -hmm. Typically, if you think of an expanding bubble, for example, if it's like an H solution, my standard number for those are like 10 kilometers per second. So, mm -hmm. I, was, so I was going to ask whether the sizes and the times and the time differences were consistent with the, an expansion velocity. Yeah, it does appear to be slower. So I think it indicates, uh, you know, uh, clouds that are uh, more resistant mm -hmm. to just being blown away and being accelerated as, a, as like a bulk mm -hmm. uh, force from a, from a central star. So uh, yeah, I think it's indicative of uh, you know uh, pressure on the cloud, but not dominance by the uh, earlier generation. Yeah, because, because I, uh, it seems to me that one important question, like we discussed yesterday, and today, yeah. is whether there, it's just coincidental that the fact that you have bubbles expanding uh, around some of these regions, and the regions were pre-existing, mm -hmm. or whether were, were they really triggered, and mm -hmm. so perhaps these velocity patterns could tell us something about it, but that's something we could discuss. Yeah, it's certainly possible. That's something we should discuss um, later on. Uh, yeah. okay, could you put your last slide of the first part? Sure thing. Oh, wow, the year over time. time. So thanks for this. This one? Then yeah, this one. Sorry. So, so is, I, I'm curious about the, the Ratliff wave. And, because if, if you are at 8 kilo, assume this galaxy is kind of typical, the one you have. So sure. the separation between two spiral arms is much larger than a few hundred parsecs. Right? Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's kiloparsecs. Yeah, it's a few kiloparsecs, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so it, it's kind of weird if you now go back to the previous slide or, or, or when you have this, this overlay. Yes. I mean, yeah, the separation between these two lines, like you said, are kind of two spiral arms and then something happens with it. This is, this is only a couple of hundred parsecs. Right? Yeah, yeah th th there was really a little bit of a, uh, you know, messing with the scales to sort of yeah. make the point uh, workable. But, you know, there are certainly cases where you have uh, uh, sort of uh, um, spiral arm aligned structures that do have separations that are comparable to that. So, for example, we have, uh, let me just go back, way back, uh, to the simulation. This year. Yeah, so you can see that, uh, you know, the sort of gaps between spiral arms is constantly evolving. Yeah, but the, it's the, the simulation. As Rosa was saying, yeah. they're not real spiral arms, right? I mean, right. I mean, well, well, the thing is that, that, that we don't actually think that uh, there, there isn't evidence of there being like a grand design structure in the Milky Way to begin with. So I think this is probably more likely to be what the Milky Way actually looks like compared to M78 or M74. So um, I think that more likely when we talk about spiral arms, we're talking about like structures aligned with the spiral arm pitch, like uh, you know, these guys here, they're aligned with the spiral arm pitch, but they are not, you know, like spiral arms as you would probably call them, I suppose. Does that yeah, make sense? Uh, it depends who you ask, but yeah, mean, if you ask Marquis and his co-workers, they, they do find fairly clear evidence of, of well-defined long spiral arms. You know, that yeah, but, but it's certainly on the messy side. It, it, it's not like there is, you know, big thing here, big thing here. It, it, there, there's a lot of like, uh, you know, arms from like branching off and merging. And you know, at least in my opinion, uh, what I've seen looks a lot more similar to this than it does to M74. This M74 is a very uh, well studied galaxy that looks very pretty. So uh, it, it's often a nice one to use as, a, as an example for spiral structure. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Nice, nice. And I have a question regarding the planet section. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, which is the planetary architectures of these systems that are now being discovered about some stars of the uh, stellar association? Yeah, so I mean, the, the thing is that uh, when we're dealing with uh, Kepler planets, these are uh, planets discovered using uh, the transit method. Mm -hmm. And the further out you go, the less of a chance you have of detecting planets. So the, the opportunity to see like multiple planet systems is it's often harder than just finding one. 
Although I think there was one of these planets, uh, or one of these uh, stars that had two. So uh, uh, if you want to check into that more, there, it's uh, uh, Bauma or Bauma uh, 2013 or, or 2023, sorry, um, and and that goes over all that uh, the, the details of the systems uh, discussed there. And we use to find a different architecture of these of planets that may be discovered around these stars uh, with respect to the planets that are discovered in the field stars? Oh, certainly, yeah. And, and I think that could be in, in, uh, indicative of, uh, you know, the evolution mechanisms that happen, you know, after the first 30 million years. And there are some that are expected to happen on longer time scales. So I think getting like a, a wide range of systems, you know, in that, uh, you know, one or zero to 100 million year range, that's going to be critical for really understanding the evolution of that, that sort of a time scale. So uh, we just don't have enough of them yet, but we are working on that one Okay. Uh, Charlie Roman has a question on Zoom. Yeah, sure. Charlie? Oh, hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes, again. Hi. Uh, very nice talk, uh, uh, The I, I, I wonder about the... Um, Let's say in, in, in most of these uh, moving groups, the massive stars are gone. Uh, and I wonder what um, what is the, but the, the medium sized stars can can also can can be help can be helpful to trace uh, what will be the 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 the, the, the gravity centers of this 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 close this. Uh, groups, if you can say, um, mm -hmm. can you can you comment on this or or what uh, and and also in what are your spectroscopic uh, in terms of your spectroscopic data? Uh, what is the typical uh, range of uh, spectral types that you are exploring, considering that massive stars are not no longer probably in most of these cases the, the, the main tracers. Yeah, sure thing. So it varies a little bit from re region to region. So in uh, CFN, for example, this is a fairly uh, low density region. The most uh, massive star there is uh, Beta CPI, which I think is a B2 star. Mm -hmm. um, and then the yeah, next ma most massive are B9s. Uh, there's there's uh, either a Conus, and I think there's another one in uh, CFN5. I can't recall the name there. I think it's an, it's an, HD, it's an HD number. Oh, right. 10198. No. <laughs> I'm not going to get that right. I, wait, no, 190833. I think that's the number. <laughs> but yeah, uh, there are uh, three B stars and there are, uh, you know, not any O stars. In something like uh, Upper Scale, which is younger and uh, generally has more stars in general, I think there are a few O stars there. And in LCC, uh, which is sort of like the older subcomponent of, uh, of uh, Soap Sand, we're looking at. Uh, <laughs> So we're, we're, we're talking about a region where there are likely to have been a few supernovae earlier in the evolution of that region. So it really depends on the region, but uh, generally speaking, massive stars are present, and the and and in uh, the older populations, they have already gone super. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. One more question in the auditorium. Anyone? <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's start. Uh,